going to die. I lost everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me. Because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. When you look at the autopsy pictures in this case, you realize that this is probably one of the worst murders that comes across a desk of a prosecutor. You know, I'm not an expert, but as I said earlier, this is probably one of the most gruesome crimes I've ever heard committed against a child by another woman. 13 years have passed since I tried this case. It is still one of the most brutal cases that I have dealt with. One of the cases that, unfortunately, I cannot forget. In March of 1991, 19-year-old Latasha Pulliam was charged with an unspeakable crime. The kidnap, rape, torture, and murder of six-year-old Shenosha Richards. The horrific tragedy began two days before spring in broad daylight on Chicago's south side. Shenosha Richards was a adorable little six-year-old girl who lived on the south side with her mom and her sister. That uh, afternoon, um, Shenosha was playing outside and un unfortunately for her, she had met Latasha in the neighborhood. She had been warned by her mother not to go anywhere with Latasha Pulliam because her mother Emma Richards knew that this was really a stranger. The 19-year-old was a known drug user and living in a semi-abandoned apartment with her much older boyfriend, 46-year-old Dwight Jordan. During that day, I went out on my own by myself to go get high. There was no plans to take anybody off the street and do anything. Latasha's version of what happened that day differs greatly from the prosecution's account. Me coming back from the party, I seen Shenosha Richards. She asked me to take care of her. She wasn't a stranger to me. I met her mother through my boyfriend, which my boyfriend and the mother, they were a couple. On that day, she asked me to take care of her because there wasn't nobody at home. And I didn't have a problem with it. The family didn't have a problem with it. I didn't have a problem with it. And yes, I was on more drugs than just cocaine at that time. Um, I went in the store, bought a bag of potatoes, and brought her back to my apartment. The day before that, she had asked her mom, do you know Latasha and her boyfriend? So they, I think, had plans. They lured her there uh, with an offer of some chips and a movie. She knows she was convinced by Latasha to go up to the apartment I think it was a semi-abandoned apartment where Latasha lived with by Jordan. Little Shenosha had no idea what was about to happen next. No, I did not know Dwight Jordan was in the apartment. Um, I told her to go inside the bedroom where there was a TV, and she did. I stayed in the kitchen and I was continuing to get high. The reason why I told her to go in the room because I'm not the type of person to get high around children, not even my own. After about 30 minutes, Latasha says she entered the bedroom. I heard Shenosha hollering, calling me, and um, when I came to see what was going on, the white Jordan was on top of her. We were actually behind her, on top of her, both actually. And um, me and him got in a confrontation. But according to Latasha's own signed statement, Rather than stop the attack, she joined in. Shenosha was sexually assaulted by both Latasha Pulliam and Dwight Jordan rectally and vaginally with the end of a hammer and a shoe polish bottle. For six-year-old Shenosha, the living nightmare was far from over. A block and a half away, Shenosha's mother and sister realize the six-year-old is missing from the park. When her older sister goes to look for her, for her to come home, she cannot find her. Uh, her sister comes home, tells her mom. Her mom sends her some other places to look for her. 
Witnesses report seeing Shinosha walk off hand in hand with Latasha, heading towards the building where Pulliam lives. Shinosha's mother decides to confront the 19-year-old, but not before calling police. They go to that location, they talk to them, they both deny seeing her whatsoever. As Emma Richards is leaving, a neighbor says to her, go back in there. There's only one way in and out of this building and I, did, I saw your daughter go up, I have not seen her come out. And I pulled up and met Miss Richards. She told me that her daughter uh, is missing and she know that the parties that were involved uh, live on the third floor. We went through the whole apartment, checking each and every room to discover, you know, or to look for her daughter. For little Shinosha, it is too late. And upon our exit, that's when we discovered the pair of legs hanging from the garbage can. That we thought was a doll. And simultaneously, we both lifted up the lid of the garbage can and we discovered Shinosha was in the garbage can uh, with her back down, feet hanging out. She sees her little arm exposed and finds her child uh, thrown in the garbage can like a piece of garbage. The little girl's body is still warm. Her skin tone was not of average skin tone. It was uh, debris from her mouth where she had aspirated apparently uh, from a result of the extinction cord being around her neck. In that case there, there was no movement of her body at all. My first response was to get her first aid which resulted in me, like I said, picking her up out of the can and getting her down to the squad car. But I do recall hearing some glass break or something break in the front, and I ran to back to the third floor. So when I looked up from the third floor window, I saw Latasha leaving from the first floor. Apparently she jumped from the first floor and I got on the radio, advised the dispatcher to notify other units outside that I had a female black running uh, from the location. Latasha is chased by some neighbor boys who see her running as well as the police and caught a short distance away. Both Latasha Pulliam and Dwight Jordan are arrested. Three days after the murder, in her own words, the 19-year-old gave a chilling account of what happened. After the sexual assault, they had to do something with Shinosha. And uh, I believe Latasha and was afraid of what would happen if Shinosha left. According to Latasha's signed statement, Shinosha pleaded for her life. She confessed to the little girl begging for her life, saying, I won't tell anybody. Please don't kill me. I like what you do to me, as they strangled her and raped her repeatedly. Now, Dwight Jordan left after the sexual assault, so Latasha was the only person left in the apartment with Shinosha Richards, and that's when, in effect, she was murdered in three different ways. Latasha admitted to putting an extension cord around Shinosha's neck. I did not know it was going to happen. I did not know. And I know in the transcripts it says this, it says that. You know, in a lot of people's cases it says this and says that. But the honest truth is, it was never planned. And she took her to another room or another apartment and set something on fire to terrorize her even more. So there, she was very methodical. She was definitely getting some secondary gain out of, out of torturing this child. She was strangled. Uh, she suffered two puncture wounds to the chest with a uh, it was consistent with a nail that was in a board that was found in the apartment. One of those wounds went into the heart. And then she was hit and beaten about the head with either the hammer or the two by four. And she was stuffed uh, naked in a garbage can in the apartment. In fact, the medical examiner's report reveals 42 different injuries on Shinosha's body. 
Her death remains one of the most gruesome child murders in Chicago history, but the story failed to capture public attention. It wasn't a big story because she was black and the kid was black. Because she was a poor black girl in Chicago. She lived on the south side of Chicago. But if it happened on the offshore, I can assure you, it would have been a front page story. But Tasha Pullion did not get made the front page. She probably made five paragraphs. Nor did the case make front page news when Cook County prosecutors announced that for 19-year-old Latasha Pulliam, they would seek maximum penalty, death. I think it was one of the most heinous crimes I've, I've ever covered against a child, especially about a woman again. In most cases involve sexual assault, sexual abuse, but rarely did they involve a woman killing a child and sexually attacking her. This was not for Dwight, this was for Latasha. Latasha was the one who used the hammer not only to sexually assault her with the handle of the hammer, but used that same hammer to crush her skull. Latasha is the one who strangled her with the electrical cord. Latasha is the one who put the board with the nails into it, into her chest and into her heart. If convicted, Latasha Pulliam could become one of only seven women sentenced to death in the state of Illinois. In June of 1994, three years after one of Chicago's most heinous crimes occurred, Latasha Pulliam and her co-defendant, Dwight Jordan, went on trial for the kidnap, sexual assault, torture, and brutal murder of six-year-old Shenosha Richards. The 23-year-old was labeled by the prosecution as a sexual sadist and a female John Wayne Gacy. The prosecution portrayed her, I believe they referred to her as having the devil within her. Um, they portrayed her as being subhuman, as being a monster, as being someone whose whole character was to prey on young children. The jury would also learn that Shenosha Richards was not Latasha's first victim. Pulliam first came to the attention of medical staff at a Chicago hospital in 1985 when she gave birth to a baby girl. I was 14 years old when I became pregnant. When I, I didn't know I was pregnant. Um, the baby's father suggested I go see the doctor, even though I was taking protection at the time, the um, phone, and, but it didn't work, I got pregnant. Several days later, the young mother checked out of the hospital, leaving the infant behind. The little girl was later placed in the care of relatives. At age 17, Latasha Pulliam found herself pregnant once again. I got around some older people who had children. They was telling me that you know drugs wouldn't harm they ba you know wouldn't harm my baby because you know look at their child. Their child was fine, and I started doing drugs. She had a baby, a little baby girl that was born prematurely. Um, at Stroger Hospital. The baby was drug exposed and spent, I think, about three to four months in the neonatal intensive care unit. The preemie suffered from cerebral palsy and a host of other medical problems. She was uh, hooked up to um, oxygen, um, tubes, everything. I felt like I was wasn't responsible enough, and no child should have to go through that. Latasha convinced a neonatologist that she was finally ready to be a mother. To the best of my recollection, Latasha did complete a drug treatment program, and the baby went home with her, and then unfortunately was readmitted about a little bit less than two months later. Her daughter was five months old, and she was admitted to the burn unit with a round second degree classic immersion burn to her buttocks. It was not an accidental burn, it was an in intentional immersion burn. I was bathed in her and the water did not feel hot to me. And I put in the bathtub, not the bathtub, correction, baseball. And she wasn't crying or screaming or anything. But later to kind of find out she was, had these blisters on her um, behind. She appeared to be remorseful. She uh, managed to convince them that she really didn't know how hot the water was. So Latasha did take her baby home again. 
She was then lost to follow-up right around a year later that uh, the neonatologist got a phone call. And she was admitted beaten and raped. She had bruises to her head. She had nail marks. She had a black eye. She had tears in her vagina. She had bruises in her vagina. She was just beaten top to bottom and raped. Uh, she displayed some significant sadistic behaviors that would indicate that, that this was a, a compulsion. Um, this was something that she was not going to be able to control herself to keep from doing. Although she certainly did know right from wrong, and she certainly knew how to cover her tracks. Latasha Pulliam should have been locked up at the time that she burned her baby. That was intentional, that was premeditated. And had she been locked up, had the system not failed in that respect, um, Shinosha would probably still be alive. And then in March of 1991, the first thing that I heard um, was on the news about a little six-year-old girl uh, being found murdered in a garbage can or dumpster and that Latasha Pulliam had been arrested for the murder. We saved her daughter's life, but that didn't keep her from killing some other child. During Latasha Pulliam's trial, the prosecution argued that her history as a child abuser was all the more reason for the jury to recommend the maximum sentence in the state of Illinois, death. But first, the defense would be allowed to present evidence that Latasha herself had endured horrendous abuse as a child. As I learned more about her, it became more understandable because she had been a victim of abuse herself and abusers tend to become abusers. The defense did what it could with what they had. They presented a theory that her mother began to physically abuse her when she was five years old. My mother was the main abuser, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I faced death more than once um, by, the, by, the, by the hands of my mother, mainly. I was drowned um, by my, the hands of my mother in hot scalding water at three that, that I can remember. I was being beat with the um, straightened uh, hair comb, burnt, things like that. But what the jury didn't hear was evidence that Latasha Pulliam was not only physically but also sexually abused when she was just an infant. Well, the Michael Reese Hospital records, which at age 22 months, noted that she has genital scarring. Along with defense attorney Anna Ehrenheim, Mary Lynn Kaplan, a licensed social worker, spent a year and a half digging up records for Latasha Pulliam's appeal. She was just uh, abused on a daily basis, physically and sexually. Five years old, my first sex was my mother. Five years old. I was scared of my mom, you know. My mom at the time was like 300 some pounds and I was just a small, petite child. You know, as she got older, she was, was prostituted by her mother. Um, she was sexually abused by her uncles. Um, every adult in her life basically abused her or severely neglected her. School records revealed disturbing behavior in the classroom and on the yard. Still, no one intervened. The principal found her in the parking lot with a, another young boy having sexual relations and three other boys standing in line to then take their turn. So despite all this overt, you know, sexual behavior, no one really went a step further and reported it to the authorities. I think Latasha is the ultimate victim. She was victimized in the most horrendous ways. I mean, her, her memories from her childhood, I can't even imagine what they are if she has any. Authorities finally took notice at age 13. They uncovered the fact that she had gotten herpes, apparently from a rape by her mother's boyfriend, 
when she was a, an adolescent. She was hospitalized for that, and that's when some real serious intervention began. Latasha spent months in a psychiatric hospital and was later placed in foster care. But it was apparently too late for the teenager who ran away repeatedly and according to the prosecution, participated in the rape of another girl. Where the two of them left the group home without permission when they were teenagers, tried to get away. She eventually, for $20, agreed to hold down this other girl while a man raped her. There's nothing that she can say that will convince me that she didn't know exactly what she was doing to Shinosha. This was a pattern with her. There are so many, you know, mirrored images here of her own abuse and neglect. It's not about, you know, what you want or who you want to be. It's who you, who you have become. The things that I find chilling as a defense lawyer is that she told the police officers, according to this statement, that Shinosha said to her, please don't hurt me, I love you. You know, Latasha might have been fantasizing that Shinosha really loved her. In 2003, after an unsuccessful appeal, Governor George Ryan granted clemency to 167 people on death row in Illinois. Latasha Pulliam is currently serving life in prison. Well, uh, since the uh, death sentence has been vacated and since she, her sentence has been computed to life, she needs to spend the rest of her life in jail. That's the sentence that, 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 that she deserves. 16 years after the murder of Shinosha Richards, Latasha Pulliam now says it was her boyfriend, Dwight Jordan, who committed the murder. This child was bludgered, punctured, and strangled, and raped. Okay, and me, my responsibility is that I should have never brought her to her apartment. Regardless, they find that I did not do the murder, did not rape this child, etc. That pain would still be on the inside of me, you know, because this child is gone. I would hope, though, that she would give some sort of respect to Shinosha's memory and stop saying, this isn't my fault, I was a victim. Own up to what you did. Um, finally say, you know what, I did this. Even if you don't say it to the public, say it to yourself. Right now, I mean, I'm focusing on that I have peace within myself, and I know God has forgiven me because only he knows what happened. myself to go get high. There was no plans to take anybody off the street and do anything. Latasha's version of what happened that day differs greatly from the prosecution's account. Me coming back from the party, I seen Shinosha Richards. She asked me to take care of her. She wasn't a stranger to me. I met her mother through my boyfriend, which my boyfriend and the mother, they were a couple. On that day, she asked me to take care of her because there wasn't nobody at home. And I didn't have a problem with it. The family didn't have a problem with it. I didn't have a problem with it. And yes, I was on one. But as I said earlier, this is probably one of the most gruesome crimes I've ever heard committed against a child by another woman. 13 years have passed since I tried this case. It is still one of the most brutal cases that I have dealt with one of the cases that unfortunately I cannot forget. In March of 1991, 19-year-old Latasha Pulliam was charged with an unspeakable crime. The kidnap, rape, torture, and murder of six-year-old Shinosha Richards. The horrific tragedy began two days before spring in broad... To die. I lost everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me. Because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth.
when you look at the autopsy pictures in this case, you realize that this is probably one of the worst murders that comes across a desk of a prosecutor. You know, I'm not an expert. Daylight on Chicago's South Side. Shenosha Richards was a adorable little six-year-old girl who lived on the south side with her mom and her sister. That uh, afternoon, um, Shenosha was playing outside, and un unfortunately for her, she had met Latasha in the neighborhood. She had been warned by her mother not to go anywhere with Latasha Pulliam because her mother, Emma Richards, knew that this was really a stranger. The 19-year-old was a known drug user and living in a semi-abandoned apartment with her much older boyfriend, 46-year-old Dwight Jordan. During that day, I went out more drugs than just cocaine at the time. Um, I went in the store, bought a bag of potatoes, and brought her back to my apartment. The day before that, she had asked her mom, do you know Latasha and her boyfriend? So they, I think, had plans. They lured her there. Uh, with an offer of some chips and a movie. Shinosha was convinced by Latasha to go up to the apartment. I think it was a semi-abandoned apartment where Latasha lived with Dwight Jordan. Little Shinosha had no idea what was about to happen next. No, I did not know Dwight Jordan was in the apartment. 